Good morning. I spoke to you last week about how I'm viewing Revelation as being a bit like a spiral. A whole lot of different threads that all lead to the same spot. So you might think, I've heard that bit before and now I'm hearing it again. Well, that's true and you'll probably hear it again later. And that they're not three different stories or four or five different stories. They're all part of the one story told from different perspectives. Just like if you go to a car accident and ask people what happened, people will tell it to you from different points of view. So these are not necessarily different points of view, but each little bit that we see perhaps emphasises something different. So today we're looking at chapter 12. Now, last week in chapter 11 spiral, we actually saw the whole story. It's the only time in Revelation you see the whole story in one chapter. And we saw that God's people will be sealed. We saw this with the measuring of the temple, where the, the temple symbolised God's people and the measuring of it symbolised keeping them together, keeping them safe, sealing them. We saw that the gospel will be declared, that the two witnesses came and preached the, the gospel of Jesus. We saw Satan's rule will bring great tribulation. We saw the beast from the abyss come up and kill the two witnesses. But we saw that in the end, Christ will be victorious and reign forever. And those things that we saw last week are part of this overall plan that is the book of Revelation. I'm not going to read right through that because it was there last week. It'll be there next week. You'll see it many, many times. <coughs> Mary. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. And that's how the story starts in chapter 12. I guess... When we think about, Mary, uh, think about this woman, it's easy to think about Mary, the mother of Jesus, because here we have a pregnant woman. But um, people who know, people who've studied this, the, the, the great scholars tell us that this does not represent Mary. It represents something else. So they tell us it's not Mary and it's not the Christian church. So we've got to ask ourselves, well, who is this woman? I want to say a little bit about imagery. If you did poetry at high school, some teacher probably said, oh, this poem has great imagery. And you thought, well, it's got a lot of words, but I don't see any pictures. I really don't understand this. The, the whole idea of imagery is where a poet or a writer uses words to create a picture in your mind. Now, the picture that's created there is usually a symbol to represent something else. So when the author, John, writes in Revelation about this woman, he's talking about her being wrapped in light, having the moon at her feet, stars over her head, and he's building up a picture. Now, that might be different to the picture you got, but it's a picture so we can look at it. And there are the things that are there. Now, the, the whole idea of symbolism and imagery is that when you get that picture, it'll make you think of something else. Last week we talked about Lucy in the sky with diamonds. There was this picture up of this woman traipsing across the sky with diamonds all over the place. Now that's all very good, but it only works in a, a poetic sense if it reminds you of the Beatles song, Lucy in the sky with diamonds, and that reminds you it's about drugs and that reminds you about something else. So the idea of imagery is that it starts off this process of remembering things. So when people read this back in John's day, the idea of her being wrapped in light would have brought to, him, brought, brought to their mind this idea from Psalm 104 where God is described as being wrapped in light. So if this woman is being described as being wrapped in light, there's some sense of her being likened to God. Now I don't remember reading anywhere in the Bible where it says Mary is likened to God. It says she's very blessed but it, that's about as deified as she gets. So there's something greater here than just Mary. 
She has the moon under her feet. Now, in Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, however you've grown up calling it, we read about God's bride, I'll, I'll say that for the time being, God's bride having those attributes. So these people would have thought back to that and thought, oh, that's, that's like Song of Solomon. So somehow this woman is the, the bride of God, more or less. Now, for a long, long time, people looked at that, uh, that song and thought it was describing the people of Israel, God's chosen people. Scholars today dispute that a little bit and think maybe that's not right. But certainly back in John's day, that would have been the thought train that came to their mind, that somehow this woman is the bride of God. And we use that same sort of imagery when we talk about the church today. We talk about the church as being the bride of Christ. Christ is the husband, the church is the bride. So this is imagery that works even for us. She has the 12 stars over her head. Well, <clears throat> the most logical thing that comes to my mind is the 12 tribes of Israel. And I suppose that would have been true in John's day too. But there are other symbolic things there. The Babylonians have the, the picture of the 12 stars as a symbol of divinity, which goes back to the idea of being wrapped in light. So there's a whole lot of stuff there that's saying, this is not Mary, this is something bigger than Mary. So what the scholars are saying is that they believe this, this woman represents the body of the church. Now, back before the birth of Jesus, that would have been the the messianic believing community of Israel, those who were looking forward to the coming of the Christ. We heard in that last song that a lot of the Old Testament points forward to the coming of Jesus. And there were these people who were longing for the coming of the Saviour. And scholars tell us that that's what this woman represents. She represents this, this whole believing community that's just searching for the coming of Jesus. Now, we might say, okay, well, aren't we part of that community? Couldn't this woman represent the Christian church? Well, no, not really, because she's about to give birth, and in fact, she is about to give birth to Jesus, and the Christian church can't give birth to Christ. I mean, Christ gives birth to the Christian church. To say it's the Christian church is a bit like putting the the cart before the horse. You just can't do that. So <clears throat> this is the picture that we have of who this woman is. Mary. Then another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. Wow. Mm -hmm. Pretty scary. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now with a lot of symbolism, we've got to try and work out what it means. We don't have to with this. Later on, we're told it is Satan. The dragon is Satan. It tells us that in verse 9. Dragons are very common in ancient mythology. Um, they appear as the Leviathan in Canaanite mytho mythology, the, the red crocodile in Egypt. And in the Old Testament, they're frequently used to represent enemies of God. And there's references there if you want to take note of them. He has seven heads. Now, the, the heads represent wisdom, and seven heads represents universal wisdom. So Satan's pretty wise. Clearly, he's not as wise as God, because if he had been, he wouldn't have challenged him in heaven and got chucked out. But I think he's probably wiser than a lot of human beings. We read in the, the Bible that he, he's talked about as being cunning, as... as maybe being a bit sneaky. He tricks people. He's certainly wiser than a lot of humans and that's how he entraps them. So we need to be careful of this wily, wise dragon. He has ten horns. Now the horns symbolise power and of course he's powerful because he's an angel and all angels are very powerful. But Satan, along with all other angels, can only exercise his power at God's discretion. Ultimately, God has control over Satan's power. Crowns are always a symbol of rule, of being a king over a kingdom. 
seven crowns here, it's representing his rule not in heaven, but his rule over the people of earth. Mary. This is a reference. Do you want the top part? Uh, his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Okay. Again, this is another biblical reference. I've been told how many biblical references there are in Revelation. I can't remember. It's four or five hundred. It's certainly many, many more references than there are verses in the book of Revelation. There's more references to the Bible in the book of Revelation than there are verses. This is another one. This is referring back to the story of Daniel. Now, the story of Daniel contains animals, a ram, a goat. The goat grows a horn and that grows into something else. And we should be able to work out from the book of Daniel what these things mean. We're actually told in... Um, have I got it up there? No, I don't think I have. We're actually told in one of the books of the Apocrypha that these are the empires being referred to. Um, in, in the st oh, I have down the bottom there. In the start of 1 Maccabees, the same story is told, but it tells us who these animals represent. So the ram represents the Medo-Persian Empire, the goat represents Greece and Alexander the Great, which grows another horn. And that another horn, that extra power that grows out of Greece there, is Antiochus Epiphanes. And we've talked about him last week, where Judas Maccabeus fought the war against him for three and a half years. So the whole mention of this not only brings to mind these enemies of Israel, but also this idea of time, times and half a time, which speaks of great tribulation. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. Okay. The imagery here is taken from Jeremiah. Um, God, speaking through Jeremiah, says, Nebuchadnezzar has devoured us, has swallowed us. And some people will say that because God here is speaking in the first person plural, the us, that this is a, an early reference to the Trinity right back there in the Old Testament. I'm not going to dwell on that, but if that's the sort of thing that interests you, I just point it out as we go. This story, this devouring us, this killing of God, is actually fulfilled in the New Testament where Herod orders the death of all babies to try and stop Jesus becoming a greater king than he was. Herod's not acting on his own there. He's been tricked by that wise old dragon. Herod is now actually working for Satan because it's Satan, not Herod, that wants to destroy the baby Jesus because Satan knows that Jesus is the one thing in the entire universe that can defeat him and Satan wants to try and stop that from happening. She gave birth to a son who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. Okay, there's the baby, we see the baby, he's snatched up to God on his throne, we see God on the throne. The woman fled into the desert, we see the desert. There's no mention of a temple. So why is the temple there? I'll come back to that in a moment. It's virtually universally accepted by all scholars that the baby being referred to here is Jesus. And that being snatched up to God refers to his resurrection. He's been taken back to God. So we can just take that as read. It is also well agreed that the desert referred to is a place of refuge rather than wilderness. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And we need to remember that the woman's not Mary, but rather it's the faithful body of the church. So it's the faithful, it's us, who are being given refu refuge. It's the, the body of the church, the people of God that are being sealed here. And it's very similar to the measuring that took place in chapter 11. 
Now, in Australia, we tend to think of the desert as a bad place. It's dry, nothing grows there. If you're going to go into the desert, you're probably going to starve to death or die of thirst. In those days, back here, when um, John was writing, there was a different concept of desert. And I think there'd have to be. Because if you've ever... I don't, how many of you have been to Israel? Quite, quite a few. Yeah, quite a few of you. Look, my first reaction when we got to Israel was, why would anyone want to fight over this place? It's terrible. It's, it's just sand and rock and mountains it's, and dirt, you know? For me, looking at it, it was a desert. But... Back in those days, the desert was a place of refuge. Elijah fled to the desert and was nourished by ravens there and angelic messengers. When Herod threatened the baby, John, uh, sorry, Mary and Joseph <coughs> fled with the baby through the desert to escape. During the persecution of Antiochus Epiphanes, those seeking righteousness and justice sought sanctuary in the wilderness. We're told that in 1 Maccabees. I'm not promoting the Apocrypha here. I'm not going away saying go away and read the Apocrypha. But what I am saying is that because it was written and it was there at that time and it was part of the Bible for a long time, it does contain useful information which historically helps us identify certain things. This time, times and half a time tribulation that we're looking at at the moment, which comes from the Maccabees idea, is foretold by Jesus in quite a long passage there in Matthew, where he's talking about how it will be at the end and how people should flee to the mountains or flee to the desert. Okay, And look, when God's people came out of Egypt, they didn't jump straight out of Egypt into a land flowing with milk and honey. They went through the desert. And the desert was a place of refuge for them. So we see here that the desert, this idea of the woman being taken to the desert, is God's way of looking after her. So why the temple? Well, this section parallels the start of chapter 11. Um, the provision of refuge for the woman for those 1260 days is the same of sealing, as the sealing of God's people for the 42 months of the tribulation, symbolised by the measuring of the temple. The birth and rescue of the baby parallels the preaching, death and resurrection of the two witnesses. So this is not a different story. This is the same story we heard last week. We're just hearing a different spiral of it. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough. And they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So Satan is defeated. But this is not the final defeat of Satan. This is the defeat in heaven. Satan still has a lot of power on earth. Now this passage clearly describes Satan's defeat in heaven and it has great similarities with other stories that come from ancient times. And I really like it when this happens. Many cultures have a flood story. Right? Many, countries have, many cultures have a creation story. You see, this is not a story made up by the Jews. This is a story which finds its way into many cultures. And the only conclusion you can draw from that is, it must be true. It must be true. It's very similar to the primeval war um, after Sa Satan sought to place his throne higher than God's and was cast out of heaven that we read about in the Apocrypha. It's very similar to the Babylonian story of Ishtar, the god of the morning star who rebelled against God and was cast out of heaven. In fact, it only appears in our Bible in one place, and that's in this reference in Isaiah, where we read, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. It does get a mention in the New Testament, but in terms of the history of the Old Testament, that's the only time it's mentioned. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, 
has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. I find this really interesting. Satan was defeated by two things, the blood of the Lamb, and that's Jesus or, or the baby of chapter 12, and by the testimony, which we've seen here represented by the two witnesses in chapter 11, but it's by all the martyrs who've testified on Jesus' behalf. Now, we're reading in Jeremiah that Satan has been cast down. And Jeremiah is foretelling the coming of Jesus, yet it's by the blood of Jesus that Satan has been cast down. You see a bit of a problem here for our human thinking? This is happening before the cause of it has even been born. You know, Jesus has caused Satan's defeat, but Jesus wasn't born at the time, although he did exist because he's been there forever. But not in the sense of being the blood of the lamb. So what this really brings home to me is that our human brains trying to understand how time works, and I think this is very relevant in Revelation because it jumps all over the place, our human brains trying to understand how time works really can't understand how time functions in the spiritual realm. It's way beyond our understanding. <clears throat> Satan is here. Oh, no, the top. Sorry, I missed it. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. So, Satan, oh, I don't think Satan is here. Um, I'm not going to say welcome Satan or anything like that, but certainly I think we have to acknowledge that Satan is here. We're told in Ephesians that the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now, now, at work amongst us. Now, I guess that raises the question, is this the thousand years? Is this the millennium? I know for many of you, this is a really important issue. And I know that some of you have different views on this. Some of you believe the rapture happens, and then you have the millennium. Some of you believe there's the millennium, and then the rapture happens. Some people believe... There is no millennium, it's just a symbolic thing. Look, I don't know the answer to these questions. It's, it's much too complicated for my brain to fathom. And, but for me, it doesn't really matter. And I'm not saying it's wrong to, to have a view one way or the other. That's a perfectly good thing to do. But for me, it doesn't matter too much because I don't go to heaven based on what I understand about the rapture or the millennium. I go to heaven based on Christ dying for me. So, for me, that's not really such a big issue. Okay? And I know that we have been sealed. We've been told that over and over and over and over again. So whether we have to go through the tribulation or not, for me, I don't see that as a big issue because neither death nor angels, demons or anything else will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're told that in Romans. Okay? We just have to stand firm to the end. And we don't know when the end will be because no one knows about that day or that hour. So how do we live during that time? Well, <clears throat> because we don't know, I don't think there's any point in getting too stressed about that. You know, do we have to endure the millennium or don't we? I don't know. And, and I can't know because I don't, the Bible tells me I can't know. I can't do anything about it because the battle belongs to the Lord. It's up to him to fight the fight and get things right. What do I have to do? I have to stand firm to the end and God will look after me during that time. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the child. 
The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Out of the serpent's reach, okay? So during that time, times and half a time, during the great tribulation, during the, the worst imaginable times, the church, represented here by the woman, will be kept safe. We just have to stand firm to the end. But God does not leave us on our own to do that in our own strength. You see, here he gives the woman the wings of a great eagle that she might fly to that place. He gives us the Holy Spirit. He equips us. He equips us to endure to the end. And he takes care of us. Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. There's nothing worse than a, an angry dragon, okay? He's, he's cranky and he wants to do something about it. <clears throat> and he's after the offspring of the woman. Now, if, if the woman represents let's say just the church of the Old Testament to keep it simple, well, her offspring is the church of the New Testament. That's us. It's the people who obey God's commands and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Satan is out to get us. Okay, this is the story of Revelation, but this, this spiral is still incomplete. We've only heard three parts of it. We've heard that God has sealed his people, and we're shown that with the woman in the desert. We've shown, been shown that God's word is preached because Jesus has come into the world. And John tells us Jesus is the word. The word was with God, the word was God, and the word came into the world. And we're told that Satan will attract, attack the church. Satan the dragon will attack the church. What happens next? Goodness me, that jumped. What happens next? Find out in Revelation chapter 13 next week. See you then. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have sealed us. We give you thanks that you look after us and keep us safe to endure whatever Satan might throw at us. Lord, we give you thanks that you don't leave us in our own strength to do this but that you have equipped us by giving us the Holy Spirit. And we pray that we might be sensitive to his leadings and would walk with him daily as we walk with you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.